Test one two one two. Test one two one two one two. Dobro jutro i dobrodošli u Boži molitveni dom. Good morning and welcome to the house of God. Vjerujem da ste radosni danas. I'm sure you are happy today. Gledajući ovo divno vrijeme. Looking at this wonderful weather. Još prošle subote. Even last Sabbath. Imali smo hladnoću. We had cold weather. I kako je sve drugačije kada dođe sunce. It's so different when the sun comes out. I želja mi je da i oni koji nas slušaju uh, i koji ste ovdje prisutni It's my desire that those who are listening and, and all of you who are present here uh, da osjetite taj blagoslov Božeg darivanja that you feel the blessings that God wants to give I ovaj naš uh, ovo naše bogoslužje ujutro This morning um, service otpočet ćemo sa pjesmom We will start with a song. I trust in the Lord. Kad me vodi moj Bog. Yeah. Kind of turned around hoping that there'd be more people. <laughs> Can I need you to sing up, guys? Can I get you to stand for me and we will sing Trust and Obey? When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still. 
and with all who will trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. But we never can prove the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey then in fellowship sweet we will sit at his feet Oh, we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust. And obey. Thank you. Pomolit ćemo se na koljenima. We'll have a prayer. Oči nebeski, i ovog jutra mi smo ti zahvalni. Dear Heavenly Father, we are very thankful this morning. Zahvalni smo ti što si nas doveo u svoj molitveni dom. Što nam daješ prilike da ti služimo. Molimo te da ti očistiš naše misli. I pomogneš nam da sve ono što ćemo slušati danas bude na blagoslov nama, a i našim bližnjima oko nas. That it is a blessing to ourselves and those around us. Molimo te, Gospode, da duhom svojim utječeš na naše misli. We pray that you will influence our thoughts. Da nam pomogneš da zaista budemo iskrena i čista tvoja djeca. Help us to be honest and clean your your clean children of God. I ovog jutra, Bože. And this morning, Lord. Molimo te za sve one koji su bolesni. We pray for all those who are sick. Koji nisu mogli doći u tvoj dom. Who could not come to your house. Da oni osjete da si pokre njih. That they will feel that you are next to them. I da osjećaju blagoslov subote. That they feel Sabbath blessings. Ti ih utješi. Please comfort them. Ti ih ohrabri. Strengthen them. I vodi ih kroz život dalje. And lead them in their life. I sve te ovo molimo u Isusovo ime. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Potražit ćemo ovoga jutra u Filipljanima, pet, u Filipljanima četvrtoj glavi četvrtom stihu. We will go to um, Philippians chapter 4 verse 4 this morning. Pavao daje savjet Filipljanima. Paul is giving his um, counsel to the Philippians. Radujte se u Gospodu svakda. Reč- Opet ću reći radujte se. Rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice. Uh, zaista mi smo sretni koji smo zdravi i koji uh, možemo doći u molitveni dom. <clears throat> We are very grateful that we are healthy and that we can come to the house of God. U čim obiteljima je sve u redu, in whose families everything is going well. Mi se zaista radujemo. We are indeed very happy. A što je sa onima koji su u velikim nevoljama? But what with those who are in great um, troubles and trials? Koji imaju problema sa zdravljem. Who have problems with their health. Koji imaju problema uh, druge vrste. Who have other problems. Da li se oni mogu radovati? Uvijek, uvijek. Can they rejoice always in the Lord? Međutim, što Pavao ovdje želi naglasiti? What does Paul want to emphasize here? Radujte se u Gospodu. Rejoice in the Lord. 
Kakva je to radost? What kind of a joy is that? Uh, zašto se mi možemo radovati kada vidimo da svi u okolo nas pate? How can we rejoice when everyone is suffering around us? Samo kad se sjetimo trenutaka kojih smo doživjeli ove godine ili koje su doživjeli ljudi na ovoj zemlji ove godine. If we just remember the moments that we have experienced this year or others have experienced this year. Zar nije strašno što se događa? It is awful what's happening. Tsunami. There's tsunamis. Potresi. There's earthquakes. Poplave ogromne. Floods. I da ne nabrajamo sve još. Let's not count everything. Uh, kako, kako se mi možemo radovati kada vidimo da su ljudi nesretni oko nas? How can we rejoice when we see um, people unhappy around us? Ali Pavao kaže radujte se i opet velim uvijek radujte se. But Paul is saying rejoice and again I say rejoice. Um, što znači radovati se u Gospodu? What does it mean to rejoice in the Lord? Što znači biti miran kad sve se oko nas ruši? What does it mean to be peaceful when everything is falling apart around us? Uh, to znači biti siguran u Gospodu. It means to be secure in the Lord. Radovati se u Gospodu znači imati mir kada se sve ruši oko nas. Be, rejoicing in the Lord means to have peace when everything is falling apart around us. Jer mi znamo da sve što se događa danas ne događa se bez Božjeg znanja. We know that everything that happens happens with God's knowledge. I zato uh, trebamo imati jedno na umu da sve što se događa je u kontroli Božoj. So we have to keep in mind that everything that happens is under God's control. Kada razmišljamo o tome da su tisuće i tisuće ljudi nestale u jednom trenutku. When we think that thousands and thousands of people have disappeared in one moment. I mnoštvo tih ljudi možda i nikada nije čulo za Boga. And maybe many of these have never heard of Christ. Čija je odgovornost? Whose responsibility is that? Da li odgovornost leži na nama? Is the responsibility on us? Da li smo propustili nešto što smo mogli iskoristiti, reći nekome o Bogu? Have we missed something? Have we um, squandered the opportunity to tell someone about God? Podijeliti tu našu radost sa drugim ljudima. To share this joy with others? Uh, mi sa nadom čekamo Isusov dolazak. We wait with hope for Christ's coming. Što će se dogoditi jednog dana ako Isus dođe, a mi nismo završili svoj posao? What will happen if, if Jesus comes and we haven't done our duty, our job? Jer mnoštvo ljudi s nadom čeka taj Isusov dolazak. Many people wait with hope for this ali, coming. Ali mnogi nikad nisu čuli za njega. But many have never heard. <clears throat> Zato neka nam Gospod pomogne da onima koji su otišli bez nade so may God help us that those who have left without any hope da da ne osjećamo da je to naša krivica jer imamo taj mir da smo učinili ono što smo mogli may that not burden us may we believe that we have done all that we can with our with what we had i imamo veliki posao pred sobom we had we have a great task before us i kao što Pavao kaže, ali radujte se. But Paul says rejoice. Radujte se u Gospodu. Rejoice in the Lord. Jer mi još uvijek imamo vrijeme. Because we still have some time. Još uvijek nam je Gospod ostavio dio života za koji ne znamo kako će dugo trajati. God has still given us time and life which we don't know how long it will be. Da osjetimo tu odgovornost prema drugim ljudima. That we may feel that responsibility towards others. I kada Isus dođe da se možemo zajedno sa njime i sa ostalim ljudima kojima smo rekli o Bogu radovati. And so that when Jesus comes we can rejoice with him and with those we have brought to him. Neka nam Gospod pomogne u tome. Amen. May God help us in this. Amen. A u daljnjem programu mi ćemo pogledati Spotlight. So, I nakon toga ćemo pokupiti dar i preći na proučavanje biblijske pouke. So now we will have mission spotlight, then we'll collect the offering and then we'll go to our study lesson.
or we couldn't take shower because there were no hot water. We just were thinking about uh, are we going to stay alive today or are we going to die? And we were only praying all the time. And thanks God we are still alive. I'm Ruslana, I'm staying here in Poland at the church. Well, my family are refugees from Ukraine. My mom, my siblings, sister and brother. Unfortunately, our father, he's a preacher and he's left in Ukraine. When the first day of war started, we hoped it will end soon, but it didn't. And the worst part was that our city, Brzezansk, was occupied on the second and third days of war, so just from the start, and we couldn't leave the city at all. And the pharmacies, the food stores were completely empty. People couldn't buy food or even like simple medicines. And also we didn't have any network or we couldn't even call that we are alive. And our grandmother, she was so worried and we couldn't tell her that we are alive. It was so bad. Ruslana and her family are among the millions of refugees fleeing the conflict in Ukraine. Few know where they will end up. The majority of us don't have relatives or friends here, and the only people who help is church. The church going to give us a chance to have a future and help us with the basic things. And here's a bedroom, so we slept here. And it's quite comfortable, it's warm here and nice. And we are really glad that church provided us a place to sleep in. Adventist churches across Europe are redefining what it means for a church to be a sanctuary. ADRA supports their efforts to take in thousands of refugees. Jesus never asked, who are you? What is your nationality? Are you a good person or a bad person? He was open. And I think this is a good example for us. When we are helping others, it's like Jesus, hence, will be through us. We change because of Jesus, of his impact on us. And we want to be his hands. We want to be his feet. Global humanitarian agency, ADRA, which is the Development and Relief Agency, ADRA, based here International. Right now, the organization has people in and around Ukraine, helping the hundreds of thousands of people flee. The groups here at home are getting involved as well. The Maryland aid group is going much farther, 5,000 miles farther, to provide direct help. It's already providing shelter to refugees in youth centers and church buildings. And our volunteers cross the border themselves into Ukraine this convoy carrying supplies. When they said, like, don't worry, you can feel like at home here and we will help you because we are your brothers and sisters in God, they just supported us and that meant so much. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me.
Good morning, everyone. We'd love you to sing along with us. We're going to sing, Seek Ye First the Kingdom of God. And you know what he promises? He promises that all these things will be added unto you. Sing along with us. verse of sweet hour of prayer. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the house of the Lord. It is uh, time for our intercessory prayer. So we've just sung sweet hour of prayer. And what a privilege it is to uh, bring our needs and requests and our praise to the Lord. And uh, during this previous week, we had been praying for Annika and Marilyn and Greg Lucas and Branko Ljubic. So next week, the people you will be praying for are Micheline Lutchman and Anna Manse. Uh, so please, if you're able, let us uh, kneel before the Father in prayer. Our gracious, loving and heavenly Father, we thank you that you have redeemed us. You have called us by name. We are your children and uh, we are all precious in your sight. You have um, sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the sacrifice for our sins, to be our healer and our redeemer. And so, Lord, it is our privilege as a church family to pray for one another. And we thank you that you have brought us to uh, your house of worship this morning. And uh, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy that sustains us all the days of our life. 
And Lord, uh, today and during this week, we, pl we uh, place before you our sister Micheline Lutchman, that you will uh, bless her, that you will strengthen her uh, in her daily work and in her life and her family, her children and uh, her extended family, that uh, they will feel your presence, Lord, during this week. Uh, where there is need for healing, please, Lord, heal, restore and forgive. And we pray for Anna Manse. Uh, she's a dear uh, member of our church family, and we thank you for her many years of service to the church. We pray that you will also, uh, Lord, guide and lead her this week. Uh, be her healer, uh, physically, mentally, spiritually, all that she needs, Lord, we ask that you will supply according to your riches in glory. Uh, bless her boys, her children, and their families also. May they draw near to you, may they cling to you, Lord, and may you be the precious saviour that we all need. Uh, thank you for, likewise, uh, hearing our, our prayers for our sick, Lord. We continue to pray and petition for Sasha Ivanovich and for uh, Ruzhica Lipkovic and for all of the others that are on our list, for Raquel's son, Amos, uh, for Don's mother, April, uh, they are all in continued need, Lord, of your healing hand. So please sustain them and give them a special blessing on this Sabbath day is our prayer. Thank you for uh, hearing our prayer and thank you that we can ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, good morning. Dobro jutro svima i subotni blagoslov. I'd like to welcome all of our visitors who are with us today and um, uh, a special warm welcome to Mladen Kirklitz and Denise, his wife, from Mildura. Mladen will be sharing the Word of God with us uh, this morning. And um, I just wanted to share a few announcements with you. We do have a bulletin in the back today, uh, if you haven't collected it yet. Uh, so next Sabbath, the 23rd, we will have communion, uh, the Lord's Supper. Uh, so let's uh, be in uh, reflection uh, this week. May the Lord give us humble hearts, teachable hearts. If we are holding an offence against anyone, this is the time to clear it during the week. May we come before the Lord with, um, with contrite hearts for our communion service next Sabbath. Uh, it is also Adra next week and also the following week, the 30th of September. Uh, I believe we have locked in uh, the ADRA director to also come and speak to us on the 30th. Her name is Rebecca uh, from the Victorian Conference, so we look forward to her visit. Uh, now, Dr. Coralia will be coming back in a few weeks, so you may recall she was with us earlier in the year, I think in, in May. Uh, so the 7th of October, she will share God's word with us in the morning. We will then have a combined lunch and straight into a workshop um, uh, with a health focus with Dr. Coralia on the 7th of October. Uh, looking ahead a few more weeks after that, so most of you would be aware every November we often have a Sabbath that we are at Gilson for a regional meeting of all the Western churches, but that will not happen this year unfortunately. However, if you do want to take a drive to the east side of town, we might also organise a bus. Um, there will be a regional at Belgrave Heights Convention Centre on the 11th of November, and it will have a special focus on Sabbath school, how to get the best value out of Sabbath school. Uh, so it's specifically um, for teachers and leaders, but everyone who attends will no doubt benefit from that. So keep that in mind. Uh, also, just to mark your calendars for our annual Christmas concert, which will be Saturday evening, the 16th of December. Um, I think that is oh, our usual prayer meeting. So we continue to obviously have a great need for, for prayer. Um, and so Monday evening, 7 o'clock, we would love to see you on Zoom. If you don't have Zoom, do you know that you can actually just still use your telephone and call in? So you can uh, arrange that through Pastor Manuel and through Yasna, so 7 o'clock on Monday night. Um, the list of our, our uh, members and family who need prayer are in the bulletin. And if you have a need that you would like to add to this, please let me know or let the pastor know. 
and uh, we will add you also to the list. Uh, thank you very much, and I wish you all a, a blessed Sabbath. Uh, thank you, worship team. Deborah did a fine job of uh, welcoming you all here this morning, but I'm going to do it again. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. What a glorious day. What a glorious day. Our Lord is so good to us, isn't he? He has given us wonderful sunshine. And if you look around, I love spring. I have to admit I love spring because everywhere I look, it's flowers blooming and the scent of spring is in the air. All the, just the beautiful scents that are brought. In fact, my neighbour has a jasmine growing on her, um, on her fence and at night the, uh, the smell of that just wafts in through my window and it's just beautiful. And it's, it's just a really, really nice time of the year to be alive, I think. We'd like you to stand with us, if you wouldn't mind, and we will sing our first hymn, 10,000 Reasons. Worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song. ladies here beside me because when we arrived this morning it was me and that was it and and it was just so lovely for them to come in and pick up microphones and help out this morning you may sit if you like because we have a treat we don't have oh we not you though not you though darling 
We are not having a children's story this morning, but we are having this beautiful girl, Sienna, and she is going to sing a special item for you. And you know what? Um, Sienna is 11, yes. Um, and I remember when I was the same sort of age, um, how encouraging people were when you got up and sang a song. If Even if you fluffed the words or if you sang a few wrong notes, it didn't matter. People were always so encouraging. And I, I want you to be encouraging to this beautiful young lady. Not that she will do any of those things, but I want you to be encouraging to her too because it is the one thing... Oh, off, we, Sorry, we need the offering first done. Do you want to stand here with me while we do that? We'll get the, the deacons to organise the offering first and that'll give her a little bit more time to get nervous. And, <laughs> and, uh, and we'll get Sienna then to sing her song for us. The offering verse that I have chosen this morning, it is in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 8. Be this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and who and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give us his, his so let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. And you always, having all suffer sufficiency in the things, may have abundance for every good work. Well, today's offering, um, it is local, for local budgets. So um, be a cheerful giver and give. So uh, the money that um, is collected will go for our church budget. Those appointed, please come and collect the offering. Shall we bow our, heads, bow our heads for prayer? Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for the uh, blessings that you give us. Thank you of this Sabbath day and the sunshine that we are enjoying today. Thank you for uh, all these people that have come to church this morning that were able to give their contribution, and it's a blessing for all. I thank you for everything in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. Dobro jutro svima. I'm one of the rare people in this church, I think, who can speak in both languages, in a beautiful English and in wonderful Croatian as well. And uh, I'm, I'm part of the crowd here. We've been here a few times, my wife Denise and I here. Denise has preached here on the last time we were here, I believe, uh, although she can't quite remember it. It was an interesting thing to happen. And we are so privileged to be here. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mladen Krklec. It's there written. And I'm pastor of Miljura Seventh Adventist Church. Miljura is the capital of the world, as we all know. It's uh, found in the center of Victoria. Everything away from Victoria is just suburbia. And we have uh, absolutely privilege to worship with that, uh, with that community and to serve two churches, Miljura and Dareton churches. Um, it's a great that you do what we do as church. This is live streaming, so I just checked. They've started the program. Everything is going well. And uh, if anybody from Miljura watches this program, we want to welcome you as well. And those of you who are 13 people watching this program, welcome to this church worship as well. Denise and I actually just are passing through. We are on holidays right now. So we are going from here to Nepal. We are going through some trekking, 13 days trekking uh, in Annapurna, which is the not towards uh, Mount Everest, but on the other side. So we will be climbing some interesting things, and I would love that intercessory prayer for you to work for us as well, because we will need those intercessory prayer. Uh, it will be an uh, exciting trip, it will be a hard trip, but uh, I don't think that Denise, we ever do something that is easy and leisurely, <laughs> apart from have breakfast in the morning, it's pretty easy. Yeah. All right, I would love to talk to you a, about uh, a weapon. This... This uh, Sabbath school was about all about weapons. And so I thought I would love to talk to you about an arrow. And we'd love to ask you if you are an arrow yourself. There's a Bible text that I would love to invite you to read with me together. It's found in Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah chapter 49 starts like this, Isaiah 49, verses 1 to 4. It says, um, Listen to me, you Icelands, hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. And this is a prophet speaking now to the people of Israel, saying, I am called by God to do a service. I'm called to give you a special message. Uh, this is him, not me. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow. Polished arrow. And concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing at all. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward, my reward is with my God. It's interesting how the Bible uses a symbol, a parable of an arrow or a sword to represent of what God is going to make out of Israel. He's going to make him a witness to people who don't know God. Is going to make him into that weapon for God, not to kill, but to defend, to pierce through the darkness and bring the light of God. I absolutely love this Bible text. And so recently, um, I try to talk about arrows. My wife, Denise, and I moved to Miljura in the beginning of 2020. Before that, we worshipped and we uh, worked as a pastoral team in Brisbane for 21 years in Brisbane area, and uh, we loved it as well. Last house that we lived 
inn was built on 309 square meters. We had a frontage of our uh, home was 10 meters and it was 31 meters long, 309 square meters. We built on it our house, four bedroom house, uh, and uh, all the lawn I could cut with my scissors. This is how small property we had in Brisbane. I don't know if you guys live in Melbourne, you probably have a similar situation here. And then we moved to ah, Mildura. Every time I say Mildura, you have to say, ah, go. So, and there we bought, much, much cheaper than anything in Melbourne and Brisbane, a house on 300, so on 3,300 square meters. So we have 3,000, not an acre, three quarters of an acre. It's just, ah. And, uh, Finally, I had enough space to take up archery. And I was talking to my wife how when I was a kid, I always had love for forests, for adventures, and I would go with my friends in the forest, we would make bow and arrows, and those arrows were absolutely everywhere because they were not as straight as this one. But it was fun, it was so much fun and so much creative childhood. And so on my 50th birthday, my wife bought me a bow and arrow. Do not cross me, all right? Not joking, I'm good guy. But finally, in my backyard, I was able to practice archery. It's long enough that I can actually practice. Bow is strong enough to shoot those arrows out of my backyard. I learned this easy way or hard way because I had to find those arrows afterwards. And I had to explain to my neighbors why I'm looking for arrows in their properties. <laughs> but archery is an amazing sport. Arrow is made of some elements. This is the first thing that is very important with arrows. Does anybody know what this is called? There's different names. We call it knock. A knock is just this little piece that stands in the bottom of the arrow. Is it important? Yes. Absolutely. It's what connects an arrow with a string of a bow. And it, from its arrow doesn't have a power in itself. If I dropped it, it will make a lot of noise, it will go nowhere. But if I put this arrow in a bow and connect it with a knock, this is what gives you ascending power. The string of the bow will give its origin of its power and send it on the way. It gives it a mighty push. And I would like to ask myself sometimes and you, what is the origin of your power? Where do you derive where does your life derive your power from? Christianity teaches that our origin is from God. Then in itself, we are, well, just a collection of molecules. But with God, when God, we are rooted in God, when we are strengthened, when we are based in the God, then everything comes from Him. When our identity, our sending power comes from God, then I'm not pushing my life by myself. That the strength comes from God, and then I have something else than just myself. I'm being sent. So my question to you, first question to you is, where are you coming from? Who sends you? Is it yourself? Is it the idea that you are just a product of evolution? Is it just the fact that you are living right now, and you will not live in a few years and nothing will happen for you? Or is there something bigger than you behind your life that pushes your life and gives it strength? Also, an arrow has this important bit. What is this called? We call it arrow tip. Is this important? It's pretty, it's pretty sharp. In fact, when I was transporting this arrow in my back yesterday, I made sure I took this off because this would pierce through everything. I don't use normally these arrow uh, tips. They are deadly and dangerous, and uh, I have a, just a much uh, less sharp <laughs> uh, tips when I practice. But these arrow tips is sent to do a job. Without it, arrow doesn't do much. It bounces off really not that too great. But if an arrow has a tip, it accomplishes the job, achieves the job for which it's sent. And my question second to you is this morning, do you have, does your life have an arrow tip? What purpose do you serve? 
What purpose are you sent to accomplish? Do you have this? Is it sharp? Is it focused? Is it at the top of your life? And question is, what are you here to achieve in this life? What am I here to do in this life? The third thing that the narrow has is these little things. What are they for? They're just decorations. They have absolutely no purpose. Just look nice, right? Nah, somebody knows. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> It does give the arrow a precision. It gives it what is giving precision of the flight. It stops it wandering off the course and hitting the cow that is just until before, you know, peacefully eating something. What happens with the arrow if it didn't have fletchings or wanes? What would happen with the arrow? Well, if you're shooting on a short distance, it would go all right. But if you need to send it for a long journey, for a long mission, it would just go like my childhood arrows, absolutely anywhere. I'm still looking for them when I go back to Krisha and see where I'm from. <laughs> Who knows where they are? <laughs> you know, what is there in my question for myself and for you is what guides your life? You may have a purpose mission. You may have setting power. But often, pastors, Christians, without guidance, without values of God, without ethics, without morals in the life, their lives wanders off the course. And they hit not just cows, but they hit actually your heart, my heart. And we get really badly injured when we don't have these guiding uh, uh, values in our life. So my question to you this morning is, how am I guiding my life? Or what is guiding my life? Is it just my sense of the best collection wisdom from the book I picked up from Kurong? Or is it God's values that are guiding my life? Is it my culture which informs me about how I should live? Or is it God who has created me? Is it just society's kind of uh, morals or agreements about what's right now good? And if this is your values, then I would just like to remind you that there was part of the world, if Second World War is one thing I would like to suggest to you. The whole nation's value were skewed because they were not from God, but because they were just from the uh, agreed values of society. So these three questions are very important to us. Where am I coming from? What is my purpose? And how am I to live my life? What happens if I took off these things from this arrow? What would happen to this sorrow? In Luke chapter 19, we find the story of Zacchaeus. And just to get into the story, can I ask you to open your Bibles in Luke chapter 19? And you know this well, this story, the story of Zacchaeus. I, I love to read the Bible because even if my words don't mean much to you, the Bible will speak from itself and will guide you and bless you today. Uh, if you would open your Bibles in Luke chapter 19, Gospel of Luke chapter 19, I will read verses 1 to 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, and man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. <clears throat> he was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd, so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So Zacchaeus came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter. He has gone to be guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today, Salvation has come to this house, because this man, too, is the son of Abraham. 
For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Or a better translation Bible, more literal says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. There was Zacchaeus, obviously a clever man, God's child, gifted with money and good brain. But he abandoned his mission to be a part of God's people, and instead he lived just for himself and for lots of money. There was no mission in his life. There was no mission to be blessing poor, looking after his people. There was nothing but just a blunt end of selfish monetary value. How much money do you need to be happy? Well, Zacchaeus needed lots of money. He was not as holy as you guys are. I know you don't care about money at all. But Zacchaeus did. And so he didn't live for this. And pretty, by the way, is this still, is this, is this still a arrow? Zacchaeus did that. He took a mission out of his way. It wasn't enough. He also cut himself away from God. How do we know that? Well, he wasn't part of his society anymore. To be a chief collector of working for the Romans, taking the money from the promised people, from the selected people of Israel, means that he would have to cut off his connection with Israel. And in his way, and we will see later on what Jesus' words confirm this, he has said, I don't have any more God as my pushing power. The Roman kingdom, the powerful kingdom of this world, they will look after me. That's who sends me. That's what my origin is. This is where I'm founded. Power in my life comes from the Roman Empire, not from the God. Is this still an arrow? <laughs> finally, finally, don't get scared, it's just a knife, it's not a weapon. Zacchaeus wasn't living just for the profit. He also cut off his values. Because when you read the Bible, you cannot but notice that he mentions this, and this is why people probably didn't like him, that his morals, his moral compass, was skewed, that he didn't mind a little bit falsely accusing people and interpreting them and taking away what's not his, his ethics for non-existence, his values were gone. And this is now Zacchaeus as Jesus finds him. Is this still an arrow? This is no longer a arrow. This is just a stick. By the way, sermon, my title sermon is, Are You an Arrow or a Stick? It's a question for you and I. It's a question I ask myself. Without tip of mission, of the purpose in life, without setting power of the knock, without veins of moral guidance, we often live our lives. And this is a life of a stick. A stick has its uses, but it's not a weapon. It's usually laying around without any job, waiting to be burnt or discarded. An arrow is a weapon to achieve a victory. A life without mission, without values, and without identity in God, who gives you power and strength, is still alive, is still a valuable life. You can still be alive if you are just a stick, if this message pierces your heart a little bit. But you are taken out of battle. You are not fighting for anything anymore. You are just sitting, I'm just sitting in front of this, in my seat, waiting for to be discarded, for my life to be over, serving no purpose, but just my own end. No one uses a stick in the battle, unless you are really stupid and go in the war with a stick. But this is a different sermon. A stick is 
outside of the battle. It's not brave. It's not included. But if you truly want to fight for the better world, for better community, for better kingdom to come, if you truly want to be brave and be a part of the fight, you can't be a stick. You have to be an arrow. You need to have your identity firmly in Christ who gives you strength. Identity has to come from this point of view of Genesis 1.27, where the Bible says, you and I were created how? In the likeness of God, in the image of God. When Satan says, go and sin against God, and then you will be like God, he is a liar. Because you and I are created like God. We already have an image of God in ourselves. This is our sending power. This is our start. This is our power. Without this, we are weak. We are not sent. We are not going anywhere. You need to have God's values that direct our lives. There in Galatians 5, you find a whole list of how we can live in sin and then it compares it to the beautiful um, fruit of the Spirit of how our value, our life can be beautiful when we have love and joy and peace and when we are guided by those beautiful things. You need to have a mission and disrupt the injustice, disrupt the poverty, disrupt the evil of today and of tomorrow because we are not just meant to defend ourselves. We are meant to attack. We talked about in this class here this morning how when Peter had his conversation with Jesus and he told him that on this rock, Jesus says, on this that Jesus is son of God, I will build a church, Jesus said, and the gates of heaven will not prevail. This is not a story of hell attacking God or God's kingdom. This is actually the, the, the view of defensive position on the part of the Satan's kingdom. No one attacks with the gates of hell. You attack with different weapon. The Jesus is saying that God's kingdom will attack the gates of Hades and they will not be able to resist when you are an arrow of God, when you have a sending mission and God is behind you, not even the gates of Hades are able to withstand. We will save people out of that place. We will do some good when we have a mission in our life. A stick just lives for itself. An arrow lives for greater purpose than self. It's living beyond itself. How does God make us from stick into an arrow? Sometimes I feel like a stick. I don't know about yourself, but sometimes I feel like I don't feel God in my life. I need to seek him. Sometimes I feel I'm failing him. My ethics is not good. My values are failing me. Sometimes I feel I don't have a mission. How do you get from the stick? To an arrow. Well, there is a Bible text that says in 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7, humble yourself. Humble yourself until the hand of God, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Bible says when you give your life and humble yourself to the master craftsman, to the origin of your life, he can recreate your life again. And your life can mean something, be for something. See, one day Jesus was passing through Zacchaeus town. And instead of ignoring Jesus, this time Zacchaeus gave him a chance. He wanted to see Jesus. So he climbed the tree, and Jesus came and approached Zacchaeus, and Jesus says, Come down, I... There's this word, must. Why must Jesus be in Zacchaeus' house? Because he must... <clears throat> Excuse me. Because he must restore him. 
he sees potential in Zacchaeus, in this small, despised man who no one likes, who is the butt of the joke of every person in Jericho. He must restore that which was lost. He must take that stick and make it into an arrow. And so he tells him, come down, let's go to your place. And I want you to do something. I want you to have a meal with you. People are not happy. There is this interesting contrast between joy of Zacchaeus and unhappiness of the people. But Jesus still goes. He is not deterred by what people say. And so when he is in house, when he is house of Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus said something interesting. He says, you know, I will give you, I will give to the poor half of what I have. What is this? When you give to the people, when you bring joy, when you bring hope, when you restore communities, when you are used as something good in your community, that's a mission, that's a purpose. I live now to restore some balance of in poverty. And he also says, and if I have wronged anyone, I have returned it. And there are veins growing on Zacchaeus' life. I have now ethics. I now have our values of God in my life. And this is how Jesus completes restoring Zacchaeus. Jesus says, Today salvation has come to this house because he is also a what? He is also son of Abraham. I'm joining him to the people of God. He is now from God. He has an origin in God. And therefore, if he belongs to God, therefore now the power of God is restored in his life. And now, Zacchaeus, you will be narrow. I love how this finishes this whole passage. For Son of Man has come to seek and find. Your Bible perhaps says, those who are lost. Original Bible language says that which was lost. It's not just that people were lost from God, but we as people have lost so much from what God has designed us to do. We have lost our identity. We have lost our values. We have lost our purpose. And so in this Bible is saying, Jesus is saying, I am going to restore your whole life, not just so you can re- exist, live alive, breathe, and, you know, use your biological function, but so you can live for something more than yourself. We have lost our connection with God, we as people, as, as humanity. We have this identity crisis, either believing that we are here by a pure lack of the nature, or that our life means nothing. And therefore, we don't have any intent or purpose. We have lost our purpose. We believe that we live just for ourselves, just for fun or food, for games, for honor, for some cheap fun, for success of this world. But this is all a lost cause because all of this disappears at the moment of our death. We have lost our values. We don't know how to live, so we endlessly We endlessly tire ourselves by trying to live our lives apart from God's values and we hurt ourselves. We hurt others. We hurt everybody we get in touch because we don't have love of God in our hearts. And if love of God guides our lives, this is the values of God that protects and guides our lives. So often we are empty, we are improvising at life, we are without value, living a broken, hurt, lonely, and mostly confused life. We are often just a stick. Today, Jesus is passing through in this Jericho. He sees up and he looks and sees you. And he says your name. He must be in your house today. Today's salvation has come to your house. What you do with your life 
is up to you. But God, Jesus, is invite you to restore that which is lost. Be an arrow. Don't be a stick. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Maladin. That was wonderful. We want to invite God to be that bow for us, to give us the, the power and the trajectory for us to be the arrows that he wants us to be. Can we please stand and sing How Great Thou Art? Father, how great Thou art. You perfect our lives. You give us so much meaning, beginning, the end, and today, sustaining power. Bless this church. Bless us all. May we give our lives into Your hands. May we humble ourselves before You, and may we become a wonderfully crafted arrow that pierces the darkness of somebody's life and bring joy and happiness and love. May we be this agent in Your in your powerful hands. We pray this for Jesus. In Jesus' name today, amen.